Okay, wake up. Come on. There we go. All right, information literacy two, a process to evaluate information. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is talk about evaluating information you find mainly from the internet, from Google. So uh, we're going to look at three types of bad information today, pseudoscience, fake news, and conspiracy theories. And let's first start, start off by talking about good information. Uh, good information comes from a trusted source a source that is an authority in the field, a source that is using standard uh, research methodology or standard uh, journalist methodology or some standard uh, recognizable uh, you know, methodology. So first off, you're going to look for trusted sources. Uh, second of all, let me get my pointer. We want to have at least uh, two supporting sources. So. Uh, as I said in the last video, you're going to cross-check and make sure that uh, what you're finding in one place is supported by something else, and you're going to want to do that also. If you see something, you want to say, well, I'm not going to trust just one web page. Uh, my microphone is, there it goes, is dropping down. Uh, we want to find it in at least two other web pages. And uh, just to uh, reiterate uh, you know some of the features of science uh, good scientific information uh, comes from research that is systematic that is there's a, a procedure that they apply to everybody uh, it's empirical in that the uh, conclusions they make are, ma are made on observations it's public in that these observations are available for everyone to see uh, we mean that uh, if I say I feel bad today, uh, that is a private observation. You cannot see that I feel bad. Uh, you know, so we're only dealing with public observations, things that other people can see. Other people could say, oh, Dr. Ashton is frowning today, and everybody could agree on that, and that would be public. And finally, falsifiable. Uh, that is, a statement could be falsified if it is wrong. That we're not saying that everything has to be falsified, but what we're saying is that uh, you, know, you have to phrase scientific information in a way which allows it to be tested, and if the test returns negative information, that scientific hypothesis can be falsified. Uh, some hypotheses just can't be hi uh, falsified. There's no way to disprove them the way they are worded. So they are not considered scientific. And another uh, thing I should mention about uh, scientific evidence is that there's a definite hierarchy of scientific evidence going from the weakest evidence to the strongest. Uh, for example, you read case reports. Uh, case reports in terms of I did this with my uh, drug rehabilitation clients and it worked. Okay, well that's a good idea, but it is a, a case report and it's one of the weakest uh, types of scientific evidence. Or you see that people have run uh, laboratory studies in vitro uh, laboratory studies or animal trials on something saying that we tried uh, this on uh, you know, uh, this type of uh, anti-addiction drug on rats, and the rats were less addicted to uh, morphine. Uh, that's uh, good, but also applying it to humans, uh, we really need to see it applied to humans. So it's a weaker form of evidence. Cross-sectional uh, studies is where we follow people uh, during time. And that is better evidence, but not really, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the strongest evidence. Case-controlled studies is studies where we uh, try to find uh, control cases for each one of our experimental groups. So, for example, let's say that I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, test this new method for treating people with addiction. So I'm, of course, doing the treatment on the people who are addicted in my program, but then who do we compare them to? 
uh, because I'm giving everybody the treatment because I'm not going to withhold it from anybody. Well, what we do is we look at important variables about our subjects, our, the people in our program. And then we find people uh, in other programs who have those characteristics also, but since they're not in my program, they're not getting the treatment. And so we compare them. And that's a better source of evidence, but not the best. Uh, cohort studies, uh, where again we look at people uh, across uh, you know, uh, different times and we see how they uh, you know, develop. So we look track people after they leave our program to see if they uh, you know, uh, you know, return to drug use or randomized controlled tri trials. And most of the time when I or one of your psychology professors talks about experiments, that's what we're talking about, randomized controlled trials. And as you can see, these experiments are almost at the top of the pyramid in that because they're experiments, they're randomized, they're controlled, they're experiments, all the good things about experiments are true in terms of internal validity. Uh, but that's just one study. And at the very top of the pyramid are meta-analyses and systematic reviews. These are uh, you know, studies where they systematically collect research studies that have been published, that is randomized controlled trials. They collect 100 of them, 50 of them, 1,000 of them, and then they use statistical analyses and a meta-analysis to analyze all that data from 1,000 studies or they systematically review the outcomes of those uh, 1,000 studies or 58 studies or whatever. This is the strongest form of evidence because uh, <clears throat> you're, not, you're avoiding any biases that could exist in one single uh, randomized controlled experiment. And there's other benefits too, but in general keep this in mind that the weakest to the strongest types of scientific evidence. So with that primer of you know, basic scientific uh, you know, epistemology under our belts, let's turn to some of the examples of bad information that you could find on the internet. The first off is pseudoscience. Pseudo meaning false, science meaning science. So Pseudoscience is characterized by an association to legitimate science. That is, they will say that I'm Professor so-and-so or I'm Dr. so-and-so when they don't really have a degree or they're really not a professor. They may wear lab coats for no reason at all just because real scientists wear lab coats. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I just had a croissant and I'm salivating. I'm sorry very unprofessional. Uh, they rely on anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal means a story, so they're relying on story evidence. Not experimental evidence, but story. So as a psychologist, I will present evidence to you in terms of uh, studies. I will say, well, a study of 150 uh, students found that in a controlled experiment, and we're talking about a controlled experiment, Anecdotal evidence is story evidence where, well, I know a friend who did this and they overcame their addiction. And so they rely on story evidence. So what's your evidence? What research can you present? Well, I know somebody who knows somebody who did this and they're better. And that's uh, not scientific. And that's an example of uh, pseudoscience. They also sidestep disproof. As I said before, real science is falsifiable, and pseudoscientific theories are usually not falsifiable, so that there's no way to really disprove a pseudoscientific theory. For example, ESP is a very popular, well-known uh, scientific theory, or pseudoscientific theory, excuse me, and the way they uh, sidestep this proof and the way they are unfalsifiable is that uh, when you do a controlled experiment on ESP and you have a bunch of people who, are, who have been identified as psychics and you test them in a controlled experiment, 
uh, they are unable to do anything above the chance level in terms of whatever psychic ability they have. So this would uh, falsify or disprove the hypothesis that these psychics have uh, ESP, but then the uh, you know uh, pseudoscientific researchers come in and say, oh, but uh, the negative vibes uh, emitted from the skeptical scientist in the experimental study uh, would work against the psychic ability of the psychics. So you really can't test psychics in a skeptical experimental setting. Well, that means you can't test psychics at all. You just have to accept their word. And also pseudoscience will simplify uh, complex scientific concepts into basic ideas. Just look at any diet and they tell you, well, losing weight is all about carbs or all about paleo or whatever. And they're taking an extremely uh, complicated scientific uh, you know, situation or concept and they're breaking it down to something very basic and very simple. Uh, one example of uh, uh, you know, uh, pseudoscience is facilitated communication. And this is when uh, autistic children, severely artist, autistic children, uh, who cannot communicate usually, are able to communicate by, as the picture shows, not really like this, but you know, a little bit more technical and scientific looking. Remember, su uh, pseudoscience, it uh, you know, tries to appear scientific, so they'll use like levers and stuff like that. But uh, you know, a, a communicator. Uh, will move an autistic child's hand over a keyboard to help the autistic child type out letters. And by doing that, they discover that autistic kids who cannot communicate actually can, and they're very intelligent, they're just unable to communicate. And uh, here is a web page uh, which looks really formal and official about how wonderful uh, you know, facilitated communication is. Uh, so let's look a little bit more. So this is ASHA, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. Uh, that is audiologists and speech pathologists. This is their national organization. And this is their position statement on facilitated communication. And again, now I'm starting to look at more reputable uh, web websites and more reputable, uh, you know, organizations. Uh, this is Love to Know, Homeschool, Gluten, Family, Health. Uh, this is not that trustworthy of a website. Uh, I could Google ASHA, uh, look at their Wikipedia uh, entry, and see that this is the licensing board for audiologists and speech pathologists. So this is a, a very prestigious organization. And this is their policy statement on facilitated communication. And here's the sum. Uh, it is a discredited technique that should not be used. There's no scientific evidence of the validity of facilitated communication. Uh, and over the several decades, uh, you know, it is clear that the uh, you know uh, messages are authored by the facilitator, that is the uh, you know the uh, helper rather than the person with the disability. And again, this is you know a pseudoscience, so it is popular even among scientists. So here, this is from PsychInfo, and PsychInfo is more trustworthy. But then, look at this. Uh, eye tracking data presented, uh, presents a challenge to the traditional facilitator influenced accounts of authorship and are consistent with the proposition that facis facilitated communication user does indeed author the sophisticated texts that are attributed to him. So this one study is saying, yes indeed, uh, we have evidence here from eye tracking data that the autistic child is actually communicating and not the adult helper. Uh, however, remember the hierarchy of evidence, uh, case controlled studies, cohort studies, even randomized control studies are weaker compared to meta-analyses. So even though this is from PsycInfo, uh, it's not to be perfectly trusted. And indeed, if we go to PsycInfo and look for 
uh, other uh, articles on facilitated communication. Uh, and again, if you just stopped at that first article, you would have probably accepted that uh, facilitated communication is a wonderful thing. Uh, but then we start to see these articles here, uh, an analysis of 11 cases. So that's a systematic review. Uh, facilitated communication and authorship, a systematic review. Uh, and then, of course, you can look for uh, meta-analyses. And what you find in these uh, reviews is that they say there is, again, no evidence uh, for facilitated communication actually being the communication of the autistic child. It is the helper uh, pushing their fingers down on buttons uh, to type out what the helper wants them to say. So again, uh, as I said before, you have to compare sources and you have to go across levels of trust. Uh, there is no one unitary answer. And I like to go back to the problem-solving metaphor uh, and uh, the answer metaphor. In school, in high school, we're dealing with what the answers that the teacher wants. Uh, college is not like that. Colleges, we're starting to deal with uh, real life and not educational systems created by your high school teacher. And in real life there's a lot of confusion even among experts. And so what you need to do is you need to uh, not look for an answer but try to understand the field and solve the problem of understanding how everything relates together. What is trustworthy, what is not, uh, what is reliable, what is not. Next up on bad information is fake news. And fake news is essentially rumors or fabricated falsehoods, and they're presented on the internet as legitimate news stories. Uh, and here's a recent example of uh, fake news. Uh, President of France tweeted this picture of the Amazon burning and at this time in August of, of 2019, uh, there was a major uh, set of major fires in the Amazon, and people were upset about it, uh, and the president of France uh, tweeted this picture. The thing is, this picture is not of the Amazon burning. Uh, and you, uh, the president of France fell for fake news and retweeted re re uh uh, fake news. So again, uh, this is like a rumor and people spread the rumor and they don't even know they're spreading a fake rumor. And how do we know that it's a fake rumor? Well, uh, you know, you could go to like some web pages and if you search the web pages you can find this scary thing. Uh, this is, these red dots are fires in the uh, South American continent in the Amazon and as we can see, there are tons of fires burning uh, during this period in the last 24 hours. And this is very scary. And this picture was also tweeted as part of the fake news. Uh, and this is real, but then this goes to, you know, goes back to how you can deal with fake news, uh, which is Google is your friend. Google some keywords and try to find the original source of the information. That is, where did this original picture come from? You could cut and paste and cut that picture out, plug it into Google Image Search, and see where it first comes out. And that, that way you can find where it's from. It's not from the Amazon at all. I forget where it is. Another continent, I think, Australia. And likewise, you can cut this out and Google search for it, and you can find where this comes from. And when I did, I found out that it comes from a NASA web page on fire information. And so I did a little reading on the web page, and what they do is they have their satellites flying over, and what NASA does is it looks for small hot spots. And the idea is that if they find a small hot spot, it's a fire. Uh, they may not be perfectly accurate, but they feel that uh, they're pretty accurate. Okay, so here we see this is what we were looking at before. This is what was being shared. And of course, uh, by itself, it looks very si uh, serious. The Amazon is burning. But look at middle of Africa here uh, and Madagascar. 
Uh, that's, you know, amazing. So if we were to believe the hype about what people were tweeting about South America, we could, would have to imagine that this part of Africa was like liquefying and melting because it was on fire. Uh, and so these are individual fires. They're not big fires. And so it's not as scary as some of the other pictures uh, that were cut out and taken out of the context were trying to make the situation seem. So how do you evaluate fake news? Uh, how do you evaluate news that you get on the internet? Well, there's the crap test. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Uh, that is, evaluate them on these elements. Uh, how timely is the information? Check the date on the web page. Is it old? Then it's probably crappy. Relevance. How important is it to uh, you know the information uh, for your needs? Uh, do a little research. Uh, see whether or not it's actually answering the question that you want. For example, a little research, like 15 minutes of research, I found that this picture of the Amazon burning and the fires in the Amazon was not really telling us about the the whole Amazon being on fire, it was telling us that there was a lot of little fires. Authority, uh, I didn't trust the websites, I went directly to the source, that is uh, NASA. Uh, accuracy and purpose, accuracy, that is how reliable, truthful, and correct of the content. Again, I found out that uh, people were misleading in terms of what they were tweeting about the Amazon being on fire. And purpose, what's the purpose? Uh, to get more tweets retweeted, ooh, say that ten times fast, uh, or whatever, some other reason. So you have to recognize you know, the purpose, and you have to evaluate these. There's no set of rules to do this. You just have to do it and get feedback from real life, and then learn from that feedback. And here's a more extensive list of crap uh, criteria. You could Google that and see the whole list. Another uh, infographic about uh, spotting fake news. Uh, again, you could uh, pause the video and read it. And uh, some fact-checking sites on the internet. I use Snopes almost weekly or daily and fact-check and PolitiFact uh, to really uh, check what I'm reading on the internet often. And then finally, conspiracy theories. Uh, conspiracy theory is an explanation of an event or situation that evokes a conspiracy by a sinister uh, actor or powerful actors. There's often a political or economic motivation, and the conspiracy theories exist or are highlighted when there's other explanations that are more probable or more likely. And one major uh, current uh, you know, vein of uh, conspiracy theories are science denial. Uh, you know, statements such as vaccine causes ac uh, autism, uh, GMOs are unhealthy, the earth is flat, that's very popular, UFOs are aliens, supplements are useful. Uh, these are all conspiracy theories, they're all part of science denial, they are all incorrect, uh, but people share them and they say that there's a conspiracy uh, to, uh, you know, uh, quiet us. So they say that, uh, you know, we know that vaccines cause autism, but there's a conspiracy by the government and the, the uh, big pharma to keep us quiet. Or GMOs are unhealthy, and there's a conspiracy by the government and the, you know, agricultural department and uh, big agriculture to keep us quiet and the earth is flat, you know, the earth is not round, it's flat, it's obviously fat, flat, and there's a conspiracy of alien shape-shifting lizards trying to make us believe this. Uh, a lot of my students believe in one of the conspiracy theories, uh, that is that autism, uh, autism is caused by uh, vaccines, uh, and uh, t even to the extent that they will uh, take their children 
uh, uh, out of vaccine programs, which is very dangerous. And this is a conspiracy theory. It's, it's based on false information. But again, uh, people spread this and they say, well, the reason why so many people are trying to uh, silence us is because you know they have a vested interest in giving out uh, vaccines and they want to keep the truth from getting to people and well let's really take the truth to people so the whole thing about vaccines and aut uh, autism started with uh, this in 1997 uh, Andrew Wakefield a doctor published in the Lancet which was a very uh, which is a very respected uh, British medical journal uh, he was looking at the measles mumps rubella vaccine and he said that the, the paper said uh, that it was increasing autism levels in his subjects. Uh, however, since the publication in 1997, the paper was discredited and the paper was retracted by The Lancet, which means that The Lancet said a year or so later, sorry, but uh, we published this and we really shouldn't have. Uh, there were some problems with it. The problems they listed were procedural errors. Uh, that is, uh, they said, the authors of the study said something about what they were doing uh, and they actually didn't do it. Uh, there was also undisclosed financial conflict of interest. That is, Wakefield was getting money from uh, a lawyer who was involved in a court case about vaccines and autism and the lawyer was uh, suing a vaccine company on behalf of parents who had an autistic child. And uh, we can see, of course, the personal benefit that the uh, uh, lawyer would receive for his own business. If this was published, he could use it in, the, uh, uh, in his court case. And then there was also ethical violations in terms of, I believe, the use of subjects and the use of their data. And so for all these reasons, the paper was discredited. Uh, it was retracted by the uh, Lancet, and it was so bad that Wakefield lost his medical license. Nevertheless, the hypothesis was taken seriously. Several ma major studies were conducted. None of those major studies found a link between any vaccine and the likelihood of developing autism. So there was a conspiracy in that Wakefield and this lawyer conspired to create a false article that would help with the lawyer's case. Uh, and then it, the, the uh, uh, paper was discredited because it was uh, you know, uh, incorrect. And then people checked up on it. And indeed, there is no link between uh, you know, you know, vaccines and autism. However, uh, many popular people, MTV uh, stars, uh, set, would say that they believe that uh, vaccine causes autism. And so people just generally accepted the fact that uh, they, that is Big Pharma, doesn't want us to know the truth. Uh, and so I'm going to be smart and I'm not going to vac vaccinate my child. And, of course, the result is, you know, we have measles outbreaks. Uh, here's one in Texas in August, and I just heard that somebody with measles showed up at Disney World. And so everybody who was at Disney World who was unvaccinated is probably at risk of, uh, you know, uh, contracting the measles. Why do people uh, believe in conspiracy theories? Well, I think it comes down to a couple psychological uh, processes. First off, you know, just good old-fashioned persuasive messaging. Uh, the message or the source uh, of the messages. Uh, that is, uh, we generally tend to look at how much other people believe in something and whether if or not these are people similar to us. And if they are, we will just go along with them and conform with them. So all of our friends or a lot of our friends are saying, well, I believe uh, vaccines are wrong and I'm not going to give them to my child. We generally tend to go along with it for that reason. Uh, expertise, uh, you know, is often uh, used as a uh, measure of how much we should believe a message. 
And so we see people who are doctors or who are wearing lab coats or who say they're from an institute. And again, this is uh, pseudoscience, but still we are letting that pseudo expertise affect us. And then uh, power, uh, you know, power of MTV stars and movie stars and rap stars saying that, you know, vaccine causes autism and I didn't, you know, vaccinate my child. Uh, I think that this also causes us to uh, want to believe in these conspiracies. And then finally, target characteristics, uh, such as the availability heuristic. Uh, that is uh, the fact that uh, vaccines cause autism. You hear about that all the time, but you never hear about the opposite. And so because of the simple availability heuristic, we generally tend to base estimates of things on how much we can re recall from memory. And so we can recall all these people talking about vaccine causes autism. And so that tends to bias us. Uh, negative reinforcement. Uh, so uh, the MTV stars who are out saying that, well, I vaccinated my child and now he's autistic. Well, uh, when a parent has a child that's hurt, uh, you know, the parent wants to make attributions that will, you know, protect themselves. Uh, they feel bad. They, they're worried that they may have been responsible uh, and uh, they over worry that they're responsible. And so uh, let's say that you vaccinate your child and there's no relationship between vaccinations and autism, but your child develops some symptoms of autism you feel bad about yourself. Is it me genetically? And there's a lot of research about this. And then somebody comes along and says, no, it's not you. These rich people lied to you to get you to do something that they knew would hurt your child. And so now, if I believe that, I don't have to feel bad about myself any longer. And that's negative reinforcement. And then cognitive dissonance. Uh, I honestly believe that the people who are involved with facilitated communication, they're not evil people. They really care about autistic children. Uh, but they, because of cognitive dissonance, actually believe that they're not typing out the answers themselves. They believe the autistic child is. And cognitive dissonance is powerful enough to do that because they are really committed to the you know, helping children. They really love autistic children and care a great deal about them. And when you have high emotions and high cognitions like that, very powerful ones, cognitive dissonance can step in and cause some very you know, significant behavior and cognitive changes. And that's it for our slideshow. So uh, good luck and good uh, researching and information finding.